Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Today I want to talk about this, this little gizmo that I built and mounted on my house. It's basically a Raspberry Pi Zero, a little software-defined radio and an antenna. And what it does is it tracks aircraft, some of them out to 250 miles, 400 kilometers away. I am picking up transmissions from aircraft telling me exactly where they are, how high they are, what way they're going and how fast they're going. And of course, their unique identifier. And I sort of, uh, I posted this on Twitter and a bunch of you asked exactly how it works. And look, honestly, building this stuff is really, really trivial at this point. It's literally, you get a Raspberry Pi, you flush it, you flash like a memory card with a special operating system. You connect your supported hardware and plug it in and it will start logging this data for you. It's using the 1090 megahertz uh, ADSB, that's Automatic Dependent Surveillance Broadcast uh, Data, that basically all commercial aircraft in the US pretty much have to have. Uh, in fact, all aircraft in the US are required to have ADS-B out, uh, but not necessarily on 1090 megahertz, if they want to fly into any of the major airports or above 10,000 feet. But uh, this is kind of different from my regular video because it's not so much focused on space, but I think you might find it interesting because if you're like me that's been interested in aviation for a long time, but maybe haven't been in aviation, you may have a, some misconceptions about how aircraft are actually attracted around the world. Like, you know, if you were like me and you grew up in the 1970s and you watched these disaster movies, you'd be seeing these them talk about, oh, we got it on the radar and they'd be tracking it. And, you, you know, being, of course, a smart individual, I knew that radar worked by sending out a high-powered radio pulse and it would hit the aircraft the metal parts would reflect the radio pulse back and we would know exactly how far away it was and the direction because we had the radar. And the thing is, most air traffic control, aircraft tracking isn't done this way. It's done, that's what's called primary surveillance radar. And uh, yes, that's essential. It does exist in the US, but it's more concerned with looking for things that aren't wanting to be seen. Whereas the people do want to be seen because they're sort of wanting to comply with regulations and fly into major airports, they are flying using secondary surveillance radar and they are using devices on board called transponders which send the signals back. So transponders uh, in aircraft, they date back to like World War II. In World War II, you know, you've got uh, aircraft flying back and forth between Britain and continental Europe and they're carrying out missions and Britain wanted to make sure that when it sent its aircraft back and they, they were coming back from Germany or wherever they were uh, carrying out their missions, they wanted to make sure that there was no enemy planes sneaking back in because Britain had this great radar system, but it needed then, it realized it needed to be able to identify the targets so it could send its interceptors to the ones that required inspection. And so the electrical engineers, they developed a device called the Parrot and this would basically get the radio pulses from the radar and then they would send out an acknowledgement pulse in a specific manner which would allow the radar operators to determine that this was a good guy. Whereas, of course, the enemy planes would not have this. So this would be, what would happen is the planes would be flying back to British airspace and the you know traffic controllers would radio them and say, okay, squawk your parrot. Yes, I'm doing this in a sort of English World War II tally-ho voice, right? Squawk your parrot. <laughs> God, that's terrible. Anyway, um, yeah, and then that would light it up. But because it generated this big, powerful signal that was really bright on the radar scope, they would then say, you know, be asked to turn it off. Strangle your parrot. Funnily enough, this terminology actually still persists today. Uh, and if you fly planes, you'll know exactly what I mean. But we'll get to that later. So obviously a very simple transponder like that was only good for a little while because you have smart people on both sides and it would be very easy to replicate. So the transponders improved over time. and By the end of the war, they were able to transmit you know, large numbers of possible response codes so you could essentially give aircraft passport, uh, passwords. Now, after the war, as time goes on, a lot of this military aviation technology starts to filter into the civilian markets and it gets standardized. So we see civilian aviation authorities start taking what was uh, the Mode 3 uh, Identification Friend or 4, or IFF, transponder, and taking that standard and turning it into civilian Mode A and also Mode C. So 
The way this works is you've got a surveillance radar which is sending out pulses at 1030 megahertz. And if two pulses are arrive within eight microseconds, the transponders recognize this as a trigger to start sending back their identification code. The identification code is a 12-bit number. It's encoded by four octal digits from zero to seven. And when it gets this signal, it sends that back as a series of pulses. It takes about 20 microseconds. Uh, yeah, 20 microseconds. Um, so if you've flown in a flight simulator, you might have seen something uh, on the panel which says 1200 all the time. That is the transponder and that's how, you know, that's how aircraft are supposed to say we are flying under visual flight rules. That's the tra that's the interface to it. You, you know, you can put different numbers in there depending upon what's required. And if you are, say, flying with air traffic control and they want to track your aircraft specifically, they will ask you to squawk, you know, one, two, three, four, right? The parrot squawking, right? It still exists today. So you set that up and now you're talking to air, air traffic controller knows exactly what your aircraft is because it's sending the correct code. There are other codes that you can put in there. Um, the There's the 7700, 7600, and 7500, right? These are 7700 basically says, you are in distress, you have an emergency, you need to land right away, right? 7600 says that you have a communications failure, you can't talk on your radios. And 7500 says you've been hijacked. So that's the cheat code you put in if you want to get some F-16 buddies to fly alongside you. Incidentally, 1200, you know, 7500, 7600, 7700, they all are have two zeros at the end because when civilian things were being introduced, there was still a lot of military gear that could read military transponders that only supported two characters. So they wanted to make sure these really important modes were visible to people that might be working on older gear. So anyway, um, that was that's mode A. What will also happen is they added mode C, and mode C is where it will send back your altitude instead. This was a civilian idea. And again, the way it works, it sends out a pair of pulses, but this time they are 21 microseconds apart, and the thing will respond with 12 bits specifying your altitude in altitudes of 100 feet. And that's actually pretty good. It, you know, with 12 bits at 100 feet, that's 400,000 feet if you ever needed to go that high, like, uh, you know, going into uh, suborbital hops. Uh, and as an aside, I don't know if the Space Shuttle ever carried one of these transponders. Uh, trans uh, I do know the Space Shuttle carried a bunch of aviation navigation gear for things like, uh, you, know, you know, beacons where it would be using them for navigation during final approach. I'm not sure if it ever had a transponder, nor would it actually necessarily need one because it was you know, a military, a government aircraft. Spaceship One, on the other hand, it might have had one on board. I think I can see one in one of the cockpit shots, but I don't know what it would be, what code it would be squawking or whatever. I don't know how you get clearance to fly up to 350,000 feet. Anyway, that is how most surveillance radar works for you know approaching air, airports. At least that's how it worked for a long time. The, this was introduced and required pretty much in the 1960s in the US. And uh, obviously it was very low technology at the time. And by the time the 1980s rolled around, there was new requirements. And they wanted something that would be broadly compatible with the same frequency ranges and the same system. So they came up with what was called mode S. And that again worked, you would get some series of interrogation pulses and it could send a response. But thanks to improved technology, it wasn't just a series of on-off pulses anymore. They could use other modulation techniques to put way more data into the same amount of bandwidth. Uh, and that was good. So yeah, the mode S stuff operated on the same frequencies, the old mode A and C stuff. But it had to interact in a way that didn't break the old stuff. Uh, so there's an interesting aside here. Uh, when you're working with the old rotating radar systems, right, they're pointing out like a narrow beam of radio waves. And you only want things to respond when they're exactly on that beam. Otherwise, your direction is going to be wrong. But you can't make a transmitter, an antenna, which is perfectly able to create a beam. You're always going to have what are called side lobes. You're going to have energy emanating out in directions that you're not intending. So to make the transponders only respond when they were right lined up with this beam, 
they would actually transmit a second pulse a moment after the very first one, right? And this second pulse would come from a different transmitter. It would go out in all directions. So it would be the transponder would look at the first two pulses, and if the second pulse was the same height as the first one, then it knew that the beam wasn't actually pointing at it. It had to make sure the first pulse was bigger. So now mode S came along and it would exploit this by transmitting two pulses of the same measure and then it's special mode S stuff. So it was able to talk to the mode S gear and the mode A and C gear would just drop it on the floor and not care about it. So yeah, interesting little aside there. Mode S was required for like large commercial aircraft and it was actually used by the, the TCAS, right? The Traffic Collision Avoidance System which would actually allow aircraft to ping each other. So they could send out ping messages and get responses and figure out uh, if you were potentially coming too close to another aircraft. Another thing that Modes S added was unique addresses for every aircraft. So if you think a four digit transponder code, that gives you 4,096 possibilities. There's a lot more aircraft than that in the world. So aircraft would get a specific one code when they were working with a certain set of uh, control towers, but they might have to change it as they go from one bit of airspace to another. With like Mode S, they started to get a full like, I don't know, 24-bit identifier, which would work with, yeah, you know, it would work pretty well. I think 16 million is, is enough. Uh, so anyway, that was there, but it wasn't required for every single aircraft. You, if you had a small Cessna or whatever, you wouldn't have to have a Mode S transponder, right? But about 10 years ago, the FAA started requiring that everybody carry uh, ADS-B. And this is this new piece of hardware. It's called, again, automatic means that it transmits automatically without those interrogation pulses. Uh, and then there's like dependent surveillance. I'm guessing it's dependent on, it's the surveillance system. And B for broadcast means that you're broadcasting. So yeah, this is a gizmo, which basically transmits mode S type responses automatically every second. It's saying, I'm here, I'm here. This is my altitude. This is my heading, right? And this is my unique identifier. So these go out and if you had a receiver, you could pick up the responses from other aircraft and you can see them relative to you. But across the US, they set up hundreds of these receiving stations that would be able to pick up the aircraft and then collect all the information. And then they would retransmit that air data when they saw it. The idea being that your transmitter would tell the ground station where you were, and then the ground station would helpfully send up a list of other aircraft that were near you so this would be sent inside an area called the hockey puck. It's like 3,500 feet above and below. So you would be able to see them. And this became, this became required on January 1st, 2020 for flying into like most major airports and above 10,000 feet. Technically, if you want to fly low to the surface and only use little airports, you don't need to have any of this equipment. But you know, pretty much every plane that you're buying is, is coming with these things these days because they're actually not that expensive when you compare it to the rest of the rest of the avionics package, right? And that's what I'm listening to. That's what that little gizmo is doing with its tiny little antenna. It is able to, it's able to pick up these signals just being transmitted by aircraft on 1090 megahertz. Now, there is another thing that I'm not getting, and that is the 978 megahertz frequency. And that tends to be used by the smaller aircraft, right? Again, things like your Cessnas. They're still required to have that if they want to fly into the airspace. But interestingly, because it's on a different frequency, it's not actually legal in other countries which may require ADSB, And we'll get to that in a bit. Um, but yeah, a lot of uh, aircraft tended to use this for a little while. And so there's a little, conf a little bit of confusion if you want to get a receiver that will receive both of those, then you need to invest a little more in special filters to make sure you've actually got the whole range. So anyway, yeah, my little base station picks this up and it then sends it across the internet to websites that are tracking aircraft, things like FlightAware and ADSB Exchange. And this is great. I can go on to like ADSB Exchange and I can actually find when I was flying 
and I can go up and look at my pass and I can do, I can look at specific manoeuvres. I can look when I was doing sharp or steep turns where you're turning like at 45 degrees and I can look and see how much my altitude varies to see if I am falling within the requirements of the Airman certification standards, which are, you know, that's basically what you're required to pass if you're going to become, if you're going to get your private pilots. So, you know, I find that fascinating, but you can also look at when you came close to another person and you were worried that you might have, you know, made some error, you can see who did what and replay that. I think this is obviously a fascinating thing. But anyway, yeah, there is actually a, a link to space that I'm going to get to. Yes, I know, I, this is a space channel. I do actually talk about space sometimes. So, um, as I said, many countries are requiring this hardware on aircraft going forwards because it simplifies the ability for them to track aircraft. But not all of them are going to be using ground stations. Canada, for example, is requiring the aircraft flying into their high altitude airspace and into airspace around some of their airports. They have to have a satellite system. So you can send the same format of data, but you're sending up to a satellite instead of sideways to stations on the ground. So the, this, uh, the first satellite that was built that was demonstrating this was the Proba satellite, which had a sub payload that was able to surveil ADSB data around the world. And once that proof of concept was there, um, it was decided that the transceivers or receivers would be put on the Iridium Next satellites. So if you remember Iridium Next was being launched by SpaceX, it was always great because we would get good information from that. They have um, 75 satellites in orbit, 66 are active, nine are kept in active reserve, and there's a handful more on the ground. They have a payload built by a company called Aerion, and that receives the transmissions from the aircraft down below. So Canada is gonna be requiring all of the aircraft that fly in the major airspace to have this satellite system. And there are advantages to the satellite system. Obviously, it's very cheap for me to build a ground receiver, right? That's cheaper than building like a satellite. But satellites work over the ocean. They work over the poles. They work everywhere. And, you know, Canada has a fairly large territory where there's not anyone living. So it makes more sense for Canada to have this, uh, this satellite system. Believe it or not, a lot of flights into the US from Europe have to pass through Canadian airspace. So they have to have this satellite receiver on it so or transmitter so that they can do this. Another interesting thing that's been seen, by the way, is military aircraft carrying these transmitters. They will frequently randomly pick uh, identifiers when they are doing missions perhaps close to other countries. Uh, it's, it's definitely been seen of US surveillance aircraft flying along borders, switching their uh, like their identifier to something completely random. Also, spacecraft have them, right? As I said, I don't know if the space shuttle had them, but you can actually go onto flight tracking websites and see Spaceship Two doing its flight up to space, and it goes up, it picks up speed, and then hits sixty-two thousand feet, and then the numbers start making very little sense. But, but yeah, Spaceship Two, it's like a regular aircraft. It flies, it glides, therefore it has to have this on board. And I. I think Spaceship One had to have one of these as well. And probably the only one that would have busted the flight altitude because I don't think X-15s had them and I certainly don't, I don't think the Space Shuttle carried one either. So yeah, look, uh, this is my little side project. I thought I found out a bunch of interesting things and I felt I wanted to share them with you. So I hope you enjoy them. I, I hope you learned a little. I'm Scott Manley, fly safe. <laughs>